they're a monument to their brilliance, right, to these pharaohs. And so it is a message which has been sent through time. And we can't reply to that message, but we can learn a lot from that message. Um, so if we're going to have two-way communication with aliens, it requires um, them to be contemporaneous with us, right? They have to be A, nearby because of the finite speed of, of light, um, and B, they have to also um, happen to have emerged about the same time that we emerged. Yeah, I don't hear nearly as much talk from like Elon and other people these days about the whole colonization of Mars. For years, that was like the thing he would lead with, always talk about it. Where are we with that? How realistic is that over the next 300 years? I mean, dude's got a trillion dollars now. That's right? what I'm saying. It's <laughs> like, put, you're telling me about the telescope costing like 10 billion or something. I'm like, buddy, come on. Yeah, he could easily do that now, right? He's got enough money to do that. Um, I mean, there's a technological challenge, which obviously he's trying to solve with Starship. Uh, Starship has is, is had like a bunch of launches. I'm not sure how many they're at now, maybe like half a dozen, a dozen or so. Um, each one they seem to be making progress, but it's a it's been a difficult nut to crack, I think, for SpaceX as to to get that to be a fully reusable uh, vehicle as they imagine it to be. And even if they get that, obviously to go to Mars requires all these extra steps like refueling in space. And, How but, would that work? Uh, so, I think, so I think the plan is to have um, like a tanker version of Starship that just that launches and it's just full of fuel. That thing orbits around the Earth. And then you have um, another Starship comes up, which is like the crewed version. And then they dock in space and it, it dumps all over the fuel to the other guy. And then once it's in space, once it's in orbit of the Earth, it's a little bit less energy now to go to Mars. So it's, mm. it's easier to go. So uh, you can't do it in one shot, I think is true. Like Starship um, with a crew and all the infrastructure it needs, it can't do it in one shot. You have to have a refueling. So that's, I don't think there's any you know, plans for Starship to test that in the near future, as far as I'm aware. So um, there's still like a lot of stuff they have to prove. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm in favor of it. I think it'd be great. I really would love to see humans work on Mars in my lifetime. Right. I don't, I don't want to do it, but I th I'd love to see somebody It'd be nice do to it. die on Mars, right? I, you go there, that's this, this is where it ends. I don't know. It's like, would you want to die in Antarctica? Because Antarctica is a lot nicer than Mars. <laughs> so, How so? Well, Antarctica is about, I mean, it's about roughly the same temperature as Mars. It's not that's that not different great. in temperature. Um, but it has atmosphere. There's no, there's hardly any atmosphere on Mars. It's a very, very small atmosphere. Uh, so, you know, if you took your helmet off, you you definitely suffocate pretty quickly. There's no oxygen to breathe. Um, and then on top of that, uh, there's water. There's tons and tons of water in Antarctica. You just melt the ice and you got water. There's hardly any water on Mars. It's really difficult to come by. There's mm. a little bit in the polar caps, but um, it's it's a much more challenging place to survive than Antarctica. So I think that's a good point of comparison. And uh, humans do live in Antarctica, but not not all year round. You know, yeah. they, it's like they'll stay there for like six months. It's like astronauts on the International Space Station. Like, yeah, you'll do a stint, but- <laughs> Yeah, don't no, sign me up, I'm No good. one wants to live their life in Antarctica. I'm good. What kind of life is that? Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. So- uh, Unless they have pyramids underground, I've heard, you know. Oh yeah, there's some, well maybe there's pyramids that. on Mars, who knows? I mean, it'd be cool to dig up Mars and see what's going on under the surface that as is, well. That's a yeah. good idea. Space 2000, 2001 Space Odyssey, that's, uh, no, that's in the moon, they find the, the monuments, right? Mm. So there could be, there could be. I mean, I'm actually a big proponent of that. I think one of the, I'd like us to do that. I think we should build structures underneath the surface of Mars and the moon for future aliens to Ooh. find. Ooh, yeah. a little reverse reverse engineering here yeah from my what we're used to my pitch is that this is the most likely way that we'll have communication with another civilization a non-human civilization but the pitch is that it'll be after we're gone and dead yeah yeah so it's it's not two-way communication it's one way it's the same way that yeah the pyramids are a form of communication right there's hydrographics yeah. been on the surface and you can decode it and they are a they're a monument to their brilliance right to these pharaohs and so it is a message which has been sent through time and we can't reply to that message but we can learn a lot from that message um so if we're going to have two-way communication with aliens it requires um them to be contemporaneous with us right they have to be a nearby because of the finite speed of, of light um and b they have to also um, happen to have emerged about the same time that we emerged and not be so far behind us that they can't use radio, but not so far ahead of us that they don't give a shit about us. So they have, you know, there's a lot of like coincidences you require to have two-way communication. So maybe that'll work out. I'd prefer that. But it might be that one day 
we come to the realization that's just not going to happen. Like we've surveyed the nearby plants. There's no one there. Um, the only option we have is to leave a message, to leave a time capsule for someone to discover one day. Couldn't that be destroyable though too? Like we always look yeah. at New York and this could all be just completely gone and no recollection yeah. that any of this existed, right? So if you're building some, whether it's a pyramid, whatever it may be, some sort of monument and your idea is, I think you said to build it underground or something like that. What's to stop, you know, a, a core event in the event that the planet fucking explodes from destroying all that on the way to rebuilding yeah. itself as a new planet? No, you're exactly right. And that's why I said Mars and, and the moon especially are not the Earth. The Earth is a terrible place to do this. Mm. Um, this, is, this is one of the advantages of going to these other planets. The Earth has weathering, right? So, yeah, if you calculate how long New York City would last for if we went away, um, it's a void of a few million years, and then yeah. there'd be a trace of it left at that point. And you see that with um, like Chernobyl, right? There's, you know, if you look at Chernobyl after that nuclear accident, there's already nature is like taking over. Right. Maybe you can grab some photos of that to to show it, but you can see um, all these like trees and and wildlife just kind of encroaching back onto that city. So yeah, I don't think there'd be any trace of uh, humanity, whatever we try to do after say. Um, 100 million years. The, yeah, it's it's like I am legend, basically. Yeah, exactly. You know? It all just kind of goes away. So the moon, though, is completely different because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. It doesn't have rain. It doesn't have wind. Um, it doesn't have any geology. There's no earthquakes. There's like very tiny lunar quakes there, but there's no volcanoes. There's no, there's nothing to like destroy anything you leave there. Mm. And so you know, it's often said that Neil Armstrong's footprints will last there for millions of years. And that's just a footprint in sand. The footprint will? Yeah, yeah. Just the imprint of his boot will last for millions wow. of years. How long will the Apollo landers last on the moon? We don't even know. We're trying to calculate that in my team right now, actually, with a science project on that. But it will probably, it will plausibly last until the sun engulfs the moon. Mm. The sun will one day get so big it engulfs the earth and the moon. And that will happen in about 5 billion years. So probably that stuff will be there long, long after we're gone. And an alien, you know, it might stumble across the moon. Because the thing is with the earth... The Earth is like a beacon for other aliens. So let's say there's an alien on the other side of the galaxy right now, 100,000 light years away from us. But they could build their own James Webb, maybe a super James Webb, and they will be able to see the Earth and they'd say, look, we can tell this planet has oxygen. Mm -hmm. We can tell this planet's got oceans, it's got land, it's got, we even probably could tell it's got people on it eventually. But even uh, because of the light time travel effect, they'd be able to, you know, they'd be looking back at basically 100,000 years ago. So maybe they wouldn't see civilization, but they'd still see that we have a rich biosphere. So they would know, here's the galactic map. This guy right here, the Earth, the solar system, there's something special about this guy. There's life on it. There's like stuff happening on this planet. And not just simple life. Oxygen is a sign of complex life. So they would know this is a unique, interesting planet. I mean, I mean this is like a good reason for alien tourism. If you were an alien tourist, the Earth, I think, would stand out as like, this is one of the best places to go mm. in, the whole, in the whole universe. Why is oxygen in particular viewed that way for complex life? Yeah, so... Oxygen is a product of uh, photosynthesis. Um, that's the only way it's made on the earth, at least. Um, so this is, uh, it took the development of cyanobacteria and plant life to to lead to, to mm -hmm. this. So that only happened about um, two and a half billion years ago. And before that, for the previous two billion years, we just had simple microbial life that was basically living off chemical gradients. And that's like much easier to do from a like internal machinery perspective of life. Um, to develop photosynthesis was a pretty big deal for life, and it, it took a, a you know significant advancement. Once you've got oxygen in the atmosphere, it was possible to have much more uh, metabolism inside cells. So you start mm. to see the development of eukaryote cells, which is really what we are. We are eukaryotes, and that allows for much more efficient energy production once you've got oxygen. So once you've got the energy, you can do more stuff. You can you can then animals start to develop, and uh, multicellular life starts to develop about a billion years ago. So all of that you know is likely we think, um, conditional upon having an oxygen-rich atmosphere. So that's a good sign that there's something interesting going on here. So I think an alien 100,000 years, you know, 100,000 light years away would look at the Earth 100,000 years ago. They'd be like, something's going on here. Let's send a ship. And it's going to take that ship probably, you know, unless someone has a warp drive or something, it's probably going to take them a damn long time to get over here. We're probably long gone by the time it gets over here. But um, they would maybe be able to detect something we leave behind. Um, or maybe this happened three billion years ago. Maybe three billion years ago they looked at the Earth 
And sure, there was no oxygen back then, but they could still see probably there was life on the earth. Um, they would detect life and be like, oh, wow. hey, maybe in a few billion years, some smart creature might develop on that planet. We're not going to be here in three billion years. We're probably going to be dead by then, but let's send something over for those guys. Uh, that's the best way for us to communicate. So there might be a time capsule, a beacon, which is really the, you know, obviously the plot of 2001 Space Odyssey, hidden in our solar system. And the best place to put it would not be the Earth, but would be underneath the surface of the moon because you'd be protected from micrometeorites. There's no weathering, there's no volcanism. So that would be the perfect place. And there are caves on the moon. These are lava tubes. So when the moon first formed, um, there was the there was a little bit of volcanism when it was first forming and it left these caverns as lava flowed underneath mm. the surface so there's these like cathedral sized tubes underneath the surface of the of the moon which if we seal those off by the way that's a perfect place for a moon base because then you could have atmosphere in these tubes maybe we have maybe we maybe someone's done that maybe mm. that's what musk's going to be doing i don't know mm. i'd love to see a moon base do that and yeah, that's like a super trivial place to put something because you literally just drive down the hole and, and dump something there. You don't even have to dig around. And uh, we haven't explored those things at all. So yeah. uh, to me, that's very exciting. Like that, if I was thinking logically in our current day and age, what is the best bet for me to, to if I want to maximize the probability of detection of something for us, that something could be found by an alien species, that's what I would do. Mm. If I build a radio beacon, that's that's a crappy suggestion because that's only going to last 100 years and it'll break at best, right? It's not going to last that long. Um, so you need something that can not require an active power system that can somehow be an information-rich uh, beacon in a obvious place that an alien might look. Yeah, it's like I was here. Yeah. We're gone, but I was here. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.